If you've been following this channel for a while and built along with my videos, chances are you've now got a VCO, a filter, and maybe a VCA in your DIY modular rack. And while these are essential modules, they're not all that usable without another important addition, an envelope generator. Why is that? What do we need an envelope generator for? Simple, we've only got two hands, best case. So there's a hard limit to how many knobs we can turn and parameters we can tweak at the same time. Also, those hands are generally sluggish, sloppy and imprecise. Wouldn't it be much better if we had some virtual programmable robot hand to help us out? That would do what we tell it to do reliably and precisely whenever we want it to? If your answer is yes, then you might be a control freak. Also, you'd probably want an envelope generator, like this one. So what exactly is happening here? Simple. This envelope generator is acting as a virtual hand, tweaking a cutoff frequency, an amplitude, a pitch. How does that work? Well, in both my oscillator and filter series, we went to great lengths to make them voltage controllable. This pays off now. Because both for the oscillator's pitch and for the filter's cutoff frequency, we now have two interchangeable options if we want to manipulate them. By turning a knob or by sending a voltage into these inputs. So if we want the filter to open up, for example, we can either turn this guy to the right or we send in a high level voltage here. Now, of course, if we only wanted to open the filter and keep it open, we could send in a fixed 12 volt signal and be done with it. That's not all that useful though. Normally you'd want the filter to close at some point too. So why not simply use a square wave oscillator? Since a square wave is really just an oscillation between a high and a low level voltage, this would indeed cause our filter to open up and close down. Even better, it would do so rhythmically, as the oscillator cycles through its phases. And while this does work, it has two severe limitations. First, the opening and closing movements are always instant, with no way of making them any more gradual. This might be what you want in some contexts, but often you'd need something less abrupt. And second, we can't change the rhythmic pattern, all we get is a constant staccato. Here's what that would sound like. I'm using a very slow square wave to control the filter's cutoff frequency. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds very static and lifeless. So what can we do about that? Well, the most obvious thing is to try and make the rising and falling edges here less steep. In envelope terms, we'd say that we want to slow down the attack and extend the release. And while this may sound complicated, it's actually anything but. All we need are two components, a resistor and a capacitor, set up like this. Now if you've seen my videos on analog filters, this setup should look strikingly familiar. That's because this is really just a box standard low pass filter. And what it does to our square wave is exactly what we said we're after. It takes the rising and falling edges and makes them less steep. Here's how it works. Once the voltage over here switches from low to high, a current will be forced through the resistor and into the capacitor, slowly filling it up. As the capacitor is being charged, the voltage at this point slowly rises. Until the cap is completely filled up, and the voltages here and here align. Then, when the input signal swings low, the whole process reverses. Now the capacitor will push its contents through the resistor and into the input, so to speak. 
This happens because the voltage on this side is much higher than the voltage over here. Then as the capacitor empties out slowly, the two voltages align again. As you can see, this will turn our square wave input into something like a very basic attack release envelope. But before we try this, we'll have to think about the appropriate values for the capacitor and resistor. Now, since we're dealing with a very, very slow square wave oscillation at the input, they'll need to be pretty big. Otherwise, the effect will be so minimal that we won't be able to tell the difference. In my experiments, a 100k resistor coupled with a 1 microfarad capacitor gave me some decent results. So I'll set this up on my breadboard, sending the input square in here, and then connecting this side to my filter CV input. Let's see how it sounds. And yeah, the filter movement is much less abrupt. We've got a slower attack and an extended release as planned. But what if we want to adjust the effect? Well, we've essentially got two options here. We could change either the capacitor or resistor value. But because switching components is not the most user-friendly strategy, I'm going to replace the fixed resistor with a potentiometer. This way we can adjust the resistance and thereby the speed of the charging and discharging process on the fly. A 1 mega ohm pot should give us a decent enough range here. Let's hear how that sounds. And yeah, we can now dial in a more or less intense effect. The only problem with this is that the attack and release phases are not adjustable independently. Changing one will always also change the other. So how can we separate the two? It's actually really easy. All we need are two diodes and another one mega ohm potentiometer. Here's how this works. Diodes, as you probably know, are basically one-way streets for electricity. So by putting two of them in parallel like this, facing in opposite directions, we are taking a two-way street and we're splitting it into two one-way streets. Where before our capacitor was charged and discharged through the same resistor, now each phase gets their own. So when the input signal swings high, a current will flow through this diode and only this diode, through this resistor and into the capacitor. And during the low phase, the current will take this other path. This means that this potentiometer now controls the attack, and this one controls the release. Cool, so let's give this a try. I'll set up the second pot over here, bring in our two diodes, and connect everything to the capacitor. As you can hear, I am now able to sculpt the filter movement much more freely. Great! So what we have here is an ultra-simple passive attack release envelope generator. Why passive? Because it does not include any form of amplification. It's getting all of its power from the square wave oscillator. Is this a problem? That very much depends on what your goals and context are. In this current form, the envelope can only properly function if two external conditions are met. The circuit triggering it, in our case the oscillator, needs to be able to provide enough current. And the circuit we're controlling, in our case the filter, needs to draw as little current as possible from our envelope. Why? Simple. Let's imagine we put a 100k resistor between our square wave oscillator and the envelope. This way, we are severely limiting the amount of current flowing into our circuit. And that means that even if we dial our attack and release pots all the way down, 
charging and discharging our capacitor here will not be instant, as we'd expect, but instead would take a while. On the other side, imagine our filter was also using the envelope to drive an LED. Since LEDs are pretty power hungry, this would basically suck our capacitor dry, and then eat up all the current coming through the attack pot, turning our envelope curve into a pretty flat line. Now granted, this is a worst case scenario. Well designed modules should always have high current outputs and low to no current inputs. Which ironically is a standard our envelope here does not live up to at all. It eats up our oscillator signal while providing nothing for the filter. Thankfully fixing that is really straightforward. We'll simply buffer both the in and output with op amps. Now if you don't know how these work, I've put a link to a thorough explanation in the description. But the basic gist is that if you set op amps up like this, they act as what we call voltage buffers. These things take in a voltage and provide an identical copy at their output, while being able to supply a decent amount of current. Because of that, it no longer really matters how much current the input can provide, and how much the next circuit eats up. Cool, but why the 1k resistor at the output here then? And what's all this additional stuff at the input? Well, unfortunately, there's other worst case scenarios we need to consider. The first one of which being a classic user error. Imagine that user plugs our envelope's output into some other module's output by accident. If that other module also uses a voltage buffer there, we'll basically create a short circuit, since buffers can not only source, but also sink plenty of current. So by placing a 1k resistor here, we make sure that in this scenario, the maximum amount of current that can flow is limited, saving our op amps from a potential early grave. Okay, easy. So now let's tackle this additional op amp over here. What kind of problem does it fix? Well, while we did make sure that our circuit gets enough current, we haven't thought about the voltage we're feeding it yet. We should though, because that voltage will determine the voltage range across which our envelope is operating. Think of it this way. If all our envelope does is take the input signal and make the rising and falling edges less steep, then the maximum height of the resulting curve is completely determined by that input signal. Why is that a problem? Because if the input signal would, for example, just swing between zero and one volt, that curve would be really flat. And a flatter curve means a reduced range of effect. When controlling our filter, for example, this flat curve would barely be able to move the cutoff point. So basically, our envelope would behave very differently depending on what kind of circuit we use to drive or trigger it. And for me, that would get very annoying very fast. But since it's very easy to eliminate this kind of external dependency, let's get rid of it. To do that, we use this op amp, which I've set up in the comparator configuration. A comparator, if you don't know, basically just looks at an input voltage, compares that input voltage to a reference voltage, and then tells us which one is higher. How does it tell us? By either pushing its output voltage up to the positive, or pulling it down to the negative supply rail. So in my case, that would be either plus or minus 12 volts. Here's how this particular setup works in detail. I've set up a voltage divider to get our reference voltage. A 100k, 47k combination gives us approximately 3.8 volts to work with. So whenever our input voltage here is higher than that, the comparator's output will jump to plus 12 volts. And if it's lower, it drops down to minus 12. Why did I choose that exact threshold? To be honest, mostly just because I had packs of 100Ks and 47Ks lying on my table when I was testing this. But I still feel that 3.8 volts is a decent value here. It's low enough that any sequencer should be able to trigger the envelope, but definitely high enough to prevent it from firing randomly because of electromagnetic interference. Okay, so now our envelope will always get the same 12 volts to work with, as long as our input signal passes the threshold. 
But what about the comparator's low state? We said that once the input drops below the threshold, we get minus 12 volts at this point. This is not ideal, because traditionally, the baseline for an envelope's output is supposed to be zero volts. Which is why I've decided to put a diode, followed by a 100k resistor to ground, between our comparator's output and the buffer's input. Here's what that does. Whenever the comparator is pushing out 12 volts, the diode conducts, and we also get about 12 volts at the buffer's input. But once the voltage here turns negative, the diode will block. Normally, the buffer's input would now be undefined or floating. But since we have this 100k resistor to ground right here, that input gets pulled down to zero volts instead. Which is why we call this a pull down resistor, by the way. And with this, we've now forced the envelope's operating voltage range to always be between zero and 12 volts. But enough theory, let's build this and see if it actually works. First, I'll set up a TL074, which is four op amps in one chip. This op amp will be our comparator, so I'll connect this socket to its non-inverting input. Next, I'll set the threshold at the inverting input with a 100k, 47k voltage divider. Using a diode, I'll then route the comparator's output to this op amp's non-inverting input. By connecting the inverting input and the output with a small jumper, I configure it as a voltage buffer. That buffer's output then links up to our existing capacitor charging and discharging paths. Finally, I'll connect that capacitor to the op-amp over here, also setting it up as a buffer. Add in the 1K output protection resistor between buffer and output socket, and we're done. To test this, let's first send in our square wave oscillation. As you can hear, everything's working pretty much like before though the range of the filter movement is significantly increased. Where it gets interesting though, is when we use a sequencer to trigger the envelope instead. To do that, we connect our envelope to the sequencer's gate output. The gate output will basically just send out a high voltage whenever a node is supposed to play. So when I push one of these pads, our envelope gets triggered and runs through its attack phase. If I hold it long enough, we reach the envelope's peak and will stay there until I let go. Then the release phase starts and eventually we return to the initial state. Cool, so now we've got a proper active attack release envelope. And while we could leave it there, I'd rather put a bit more effort in to give us finer control over the envelope curve's shape. On the left side here, I've drawn up what our current circuit is capable of producing. A simple attack release curve. On the other side, we have a more complex attack, decay, sustain, release curve. What's the difference? Well, while both curves have an attack and a release phase, the one on the right adds a decay phase and the ability to set a specific sustain level. The idea here is this. If the sustain is set to a lower value than the envelope's peak, we get this drop after the attack. This is the decay phase. Once that's through, the curve settles on the set sustain level while the input signal stays high. From here, we enter the release once the input swings low. What's the benefit of this added complexity? Simple, we can produce a wider variety of sounds. Me personally, I really like short, plucky percussive hits and also glidey acid bass lines. And both of those are not really doable with a simple attack release envelope. Now, turning the circuit we have into a proper ADSR envelope is sadly somewhat out of scope for this video. Still, with very little extra effort, we can build something that approximates it. Here's how that would work. 
As you can see, I've basically just copied our comparator and pasted it down here. Both the new and the original one get the input signal, and they share the reference voltage, but I've placed a high pass filter before this one. Now, if you don't know, a basic high pass will turn a square wave cycle into two short voltage spikes. First, a positive one when the input transitions from low to high, and then a negative one when it drops from high to low. Now, since we're not interested in the negative spike, and it could cause our comparator to glitch out under certain circumstances, I've decided to block it with another diode 100k resistor combination. Okay, but what do we need the positive one for? Simple. By feeding this positive spike into our comparator, we get a quick 12 volts burst right when the envelope is triggered. So, with a fast attack, the envelope's curve will always start at the peak level. Why is that important? To answer that, we'll first have to talk about the other comparator down here. Since it doesn't have a high pass at its input, it will simply behave like the comparator in our previous iteration. Whenever the input voltage is above 3.8 volts, we'll get a constant 12 volts at the output. The diode here serves the same purpose as the one up there. It blocks the comparator's low state. After this, I've set up another potentiometer as a variable voltage divider. This allows us to take the 12 volts during the comparator's high phase and freely scale them to any value between those 12 and 0 volts. And whatever voltage we dial in here will be our sustain level. Why? Because this 100k resistor doesn't connect straight to ground like before, but rather to our sustain level voltage. If that sounds confusing, let's break it down step by step. So our input starts out low. This means that both our comparator's outputs sit at minus 12 volts. But because of our two diodes, this doesn't propagate, and so our buffer's input gets pulled down to 0 volts through the 100k resistor and potentiometer, giving us 0 volts at the envelope's output as well. Next, let's assume that the input signal goes high. This will do two things. We'll get a voltage spike after our high pass, which gets converted into a short 12 volts burst by this comparator. Simultaneously, the other comparator pushes out a constant 12 volts that gets scaled down by our sustain potentiometer. Let's assume we've set it to about 50%. And this means that at the buffer's input, we've got our 12 volts burst coming from here, and a constant 6 volts coming from down here. Now, since there's no resistor in this path, but a 100k in this one, the burst will win and push the overall voltage here up to about 12 volts. Our buffer, being a buffer, will copy those 12 volts and push them out over here. Again assuming that we've dialed in a fast attack, there will be a pretty low resistance on this path, allowing the capacitor to be charged up to about 12 volts before the burst here is over. So at this point, our envelope's output sits somewhere around 12 volts, its peak value. But because the burst here is a burst, it'll quickly die down and the comparator's output will drop to minus 12 volts. So suddenly, with this diode blocking, the only voltage applied to the buffer's input is our sustain level, 6 volts. This means that our buffer's output will drop from around 12 to those 6 volts, allowing our capacitor to partially discharge through this path. Because, remember, the burst charged it up to around 12 volts. Once the voltage here has dropped to the sustain level, it will stabilize, giving us a constant 6 volts at the envelope's output. Until the input signal swings low, our buffer's output drops to 0 volts, and the capacitor is allowed to complete its discharging process. The result is an output curve with four distinct phases. Attack, decay, sustain, and release. Now, as you might have noticed, there are two rather big caveats here. First, both in the decay and the release phase, the capacitor discharges through the same potentiometer. This means that you can't control those two phases individually. Changing one will also change the other. 
so we can never have a curve with a long decay and a super short release. Second, the decay phase is directly dependent on the set attack. Why is that? Simple. If we dial in a slow attack, the capacitor will not be charged up to the peak level during the short initial burst. Maybe it won't even reach the set sustain level, let alone surpass it. So in effect, we basically skip the decay phase, as we are never dropping down to the sustain level. Now granted, a proper ADSR envelope shouldn't have these two problems. But for how simple our circuit is, and how few components it uses, I think we can book this as a worthwhile trade-off. If you're on board with this, let's take to the breadboard and see if it all works as expected. First, let's put the high pass between our input socket and the comparator. For that, I'll simply route the signal through a 1 microfarad capacitor, followed by a diode connected to the comparator's input. Add in the 10k and 100k resistors to ground, and then we'll set this op-amp up as a comparator as well. So I'll connect these two inverting inputs, while slightly reworking our 100k, 47k voltage divider. For the non-inverting input, we'll just grab the signal directly from the input socket. Next, I'll add in our sustain potentiometer. The left side connects straight to ground, while the right side gets the comparator's output through a diode. Finally, this 100k resistor shouldn't link to ground, but to the sustain pot's middle connector instead. All done. For demonstration purposes, I'll also connect an LED to the envelope's output, so we can see what's going on. If you try this, make sure to put a big enough resistor before that LED. A 2K should do the trick. So let's give this a try. To start out, I'll trigger the envelope manually again by pushing one of these pads. I've dialed in a very fast attack, a short to medium decay and release, and a 50% sustain level. Here's what that sounds like. I think you can clearly hear and see the initial burst, followed by the slow drop to the sustain level, followed by the trail off once I let go of the pad. Here's what happens if I play with the sustain and decay release pods a bit. Okay, but what about the attack? Well, let's first try to slow it down just a touch. As you can hear, we still get somewhat of a decay phase after the attack. But watch what happens as I slow that attack way down. As expected, we basically skip the decay phase. To wrap things up, let's try it with a proper sequence. I'm sending the filter's output into a VCA, which is also controlled by our envelope, giving us a proper traditional monosynth voice in total. Here's what that sounds like.
so even though this circuit isn't perfect, we can still get a bunch of different sounds from it. Even some percussive hits and acid bass lines, which I am quite happy with. Still, it bugs me a bit that we can't control decay and release independently, as that would be necessary to get an even better acid sound. So in a future video, we'll try to beef our circuit up and turn it into a proper ADSR envelope. In the meantime, be sure to check out my Patreon, where you can get access to a bunch of bonus content, like PCB layouts, a livestream replay archive, and a private Discord community. Anyways, thanks for watching, and until next time, see ya!